Okay, I believe everyone is in. Thank you all so much for coming. Good evening. My name is Adrianette Ciccone, and I have the privilege of moderating this panel, the panel this evening. This panel will focus on the disparate impact that COVID-19 is having. From what I heard today, we have lost nearly 2,000 people across the country from COVID-19. And before we begin the panel, I wanna take the time to acknowledge all of those <clears throat> we have lost in the pandemic and let their families and loved ones know that they are in our thoughts and prayers. I myself have been uh, impacted by COVID-19. I've had family members um, who have contracted COVID-19 and um, it is definitely something that is relevant and timely. I thank everyone for coming. I thank my panelists for coming and I am very excited to have everyone here this evening. I'm going to begin by introducing my esteemed panelists. So first we have Dr. Pascal DeBell. He is a proud graduate of Tufts Medical School and has been in practice as a doctor for over 10 years. He currently um, is a doctor at the Southern, uh, in Southern California at the Kidney Consultants Medical Group, Inc. And he is a CEO and founder of Cath Dry, Inc. Dr. DeBell focuses on nephrology and hypertension. Thank you so much, Pascal, for being with us this evening and for being on the front lines day in and day out. We appreciate you and all of those who work in the medical field and all of the first responders. Thank you so much. Next, we have attorney Maria D. Dominguez. Maria was born and raised in East Oakland on Ohlone land. Maria Sheher is an attorney with extensive community advocacy and public interest experience who is grounded in her indigenous immigrant and working class Salvadoran Mexican roots. She works for the Alameda County Public Health Department in their Health Equity Policy and Planning Unit as a local policy coordinator designing and leading initiatives that address the social, environmental, and economic conditions that impact health outcomes to eliminate health inequities. Maria is also part of the Alameda County COVID recovery team, and she was recently elected to serve as co-president of the East Bay La Raza Lawyers Association. Thank you so much, Maria. Next, I have the privilege of introducing my sorority sister, uh, Larissa, Dr. Larissa Estes White. She serves as the executive director of All In Alameda County. She has over 20 years of experience in allied health, healthcare, and public health with a focus on community and equity. Prior to joining Alameda County, Dr. Estes White served as the manager of community partners partnerships at UCSF Benioff. Children's Hospital in Oakland, um, the Department of Community Health and Engagement at BCHO. Dr. Estes White cultivated and maintained community partnerships associated with several health equity programs, including injury prevention, transportation, trauma-informed systems, food security, and early literacy. Throughout her career, she has served as a key author of several publications on women's health, Accountable Communities for Health, Medical High Utilization, and Mental Health and Well-Being. She is interested in integrating evidence-informed strategies into policy and practice across sectors that impact community health and well-being. She has prior experience in program planning, implementation, and evaluation, maternal and child health, women's health, mental health, and well-being, and public health policy analysis at the federal, state, and local level. Dr. Estes White received her BS in athletic training from Duquesne University, an MPH in family and child health from the University of Arizona, and a doctor in public health and community health practice from University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston. Dr. Estes White is a contributing faculty member with Walden University School of Health Sciences. She is a member of the Junior League of Oakland East Bay and Alpha Kappa Alpha, Alpha Sorority Incorporated and serves on the board of directors for the College of Behavioral Health Leadership and Health Ministry for St. Columba, Columba Catholic Church in Oakland. Thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Estes White. 
Next, we will hear from um, Dr. Alexander Martos. Um, Alex, as I call him, is a senior consultant in the Equity, Inclusion, and Diversity Department of the Southern California Permanente Medical Group of Kaiser Permanente. Alex received his doctorate in September 2018 from Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health Department of Sociomedical Sciences. His doctoral research, based out of the Williams Institute at the UCLA School of Law, explored healthcare access and utilization among lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people across the United States. At Kaiser Permanente, Alex, Alex's work has focused on the expansion of Southern California's region's health equity portfolio, as well as the development of workforce equity initiatives across the physician partnership. So we have some major heavy hitters with us this evening. So thank you, Alex. Thank you, everyone. And now um, attorney Maria will provide some grounding for us and just give us a, a, a clear picture of what's actually happening with COVID-19 and race. Thank you so much, Adrianette. And um, it's an honor and privilege to be here this evening with my colleagues to talk about such an important topic in our communities and globally. Um, what comes to mind is my tia in El Salvador who passed away a couple of months ago from complications due to COVID-19. And this is something that is affecting us uh, globally and um, here at home as well. So uh, I wanna echo your words that my heart goes out to everybody and that uh, we're, we're here, that's why we're here tonight, I think, and thank you to everyone who's joining us. So I'd like to present an overview of uh, California's uh, COVID-19 tier status system, and also provide some statistics and data on how COVID-19 has impacted black and brown communities, indigenous communities, communities of color. And I will start with um, some information from the state of California's Department of Public Health and what they have called the California Blueprint for a Safer Economy, which is our state's blueprint on measuring COVID-19 rates throughout the state. And um, as the shelter in place order progressed and the pandemic progressed into the summer, you know, we ended up now with a four color tier assignment uh, whereas before, you know, the, the, the state was kind of catching up and trying to figure out, you know, how to best categorize all the 58 counties. And so we are operating with this four color tier assignment that some of you probably, especially in the last few weeks, have become really aware of the different tiers, which are widespread, which is the riskiest level of transmission, then substantial, moderate, and minimal. And so what you have here uh, is the criteria for loosening and tightening the restrictions to minimize the risk. And the metrics that are used are the number of new cases, the rate of positive tests, and a new uh, metric, which is the health equity metric that was introduced in October to also capture what was the effect on the most disadvantaged communities within the counties so that the state and the counties as they were reopening were also looking at, well, what is the status of those particular communities within the county where they might be most affected? There could be particular hotspots. And so using these four, these um, three metrics, uh, that's what's used to assign the different uh, tiers. And um, as you might have already noticed, what's been happening in the last two weeks and really after Halloween celebration slash holiday is as you see on your far left on October 25th, uh, you see some combination of purple, red, orange, and even some yellow. And as we moved into November, start seeing change toward the more red and more purple. Fast forward to November 28th, just this past weekend, where you have almost 90% of the state in the purple tier. And as of today, and matter of fact, since November 28th, we have one additional county now in the purple tier, 
So we have 99% of our state in the highest risk of transmission um, with 30.2 new COVID positive cases per day per 100,000 residents and a 6.4 positivity rate. And unfortunately, um, we are expecting um, these numbers to, to climb unless uh, we can flatten the curve. And um, as I will go more into the other slides, um, you, will sh you will see how particular communities and black and brown communities are disproportionately affected. And I'd like to note that the one county that's in the moderate, it's notable that it's the second least pop populated county in our state. So, uh, you know, it is an outlier and um, hopefully the five counties that are in red will be able to stay in, in red or and do better. Um, but again, it could be very, it's, it's projected that we're gonna, the entire state is gonna be in the purple tier. And what's really scary about that is the, the effect on the intensive care unit capacity. And I know we have um, uh, Dr. Uh, Pascal who's gonna talk more about this later. Uh, probably we'll touch on this, but uh, we saw this really scary uh, table showing that there's projections that throughout the state, we're probably gonna reach our ICU capacity by mid-December. And regionally, you know, it, there's a different picture and that's something to keep in mind that it's really important to look at what's going on locally and how is COVID affecting communities locally. In the Bay Area, that projection, um, we have more of a cushion. It's, we, we're, not, we're not projected to reach our capacity until early January. Um, but how, however, if you look at um, San Joaquin Valley, mid-December, Northern Northern California, so Sacramento counties, um, Redding, uh, early December. Southern California, mid late December. We know that Los Angeles County in particular is heavily impacted, a large number of cases there. And so, yeah, this, this, is, this is somber news. It's not to scare people, but this is our reality and it is a scary time. So here's our statewide data dashboard of positive cases. And I know the num numbers look small, I tried to make this as large as possible to fit in, in onto the slide, but I do want to point out that this data is available on the state's website, the covid19.ca.gov, and here's a snapshot of the data um, as of November 29th, and on the far left, you'll see the positive cases by county, and again, Los Angeles, Los Angeles is leading at the top with 391,000 cases, and then you'll also see some other demographic information, including a gender breakdown, which unfortunately it's a binary uh, gender breakdown. We also have an age breakdown and then the race ethnicity breakdown, which I'll get more into in the following slides. And this data is available and is updated pretty regularly. And you can look at you know, the data for your particular county as well. Now the statewide data for uh, dashboard on the deaths, Similarly to the breakdown in the previous slide of the cases, you have the, lar the highest number of deaths in Los Angeles County. And on the far right, uh, this is an interactive dashboard. So when you click on it on the website, you can look at what is the percentage of race ethnicity of the California population and relative to how they're impacted, which I've broken down in this table here. So looking at the race ethnicity and using the markers, the, the racial groups that the state uses based on unfortunately census data, you'll see um, at a glance that there's some groups missing. Like where's the Middle Eastern category? You know, where's South Asians? Where's Southeast Asians? Um, and I know in our discussion, we'll get more into the importance of disaggregating data, but these are the, markers that the state uses. So for example, American Indian or Alaska Native, they're about 1% of the state population. The state says that statewide, they're zero, they represent 0% 0 of the positive cases and 0% of the deaths. 
But we know that when you look at a county that does have a higher uh, population of residents in this ethnic category, that these numbers will look different. Uh, Asian, again, you know, it's all, everyone's put under one category, but we know that depending on where, what part of the state that you're in, these numbers could be different, but statewide, they represent 15% of the population and 6% of the positive cases and 12% of the deaths. When you look at the black population, there are only 6% of the California population, 4% of positive cases, yet 7% of the deaths. And we know that when we're looking at national data, that number is a lot higher. And depending again on what, what state you're in and what region, that number um, is higher, is often higher. And then for the Latino population or Latinx or Latine, which I've also been um, hearing more often, uh, we represent 39% of the California population and 59% of the positive cases in California and 49% of the deaths. So I know in, in our county, um, this is something that is, is hitting home because we, the Latino population in our county does have of very high numbers. And again, this will vary county by county, but this, these are the statewide numbers. And Maria, yeah. that's, that's the reason why we're having this tonight because as, we can, as we're looking at the numbers, I mean, in the Latinx population, 39% of California's population, 59% of positive cases and 49% of deaths. If that's not disparate impact, I don't know what disparate impact is, honestly. Yes, and uh, you know, going into the next category, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander, there's been a huge push, especially led by um, the Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander community, the uh, API community, um, to disaggregate the data. And more and more counties are doing this, and I'm glad that that's happening because, for example, in our county, um, this is the third group that's most impacted by COVID, and that story will not be captured if they they're um, put in, in a different category. And so um, when I look at this 0%, 1%, 1%, I mean, I know that um, one life is too many. And, uh, and it's important you know, to have context um, for the data. And I know we'll get more into those stories. So I just wanna you know, keep that and remind people. For the white population, they represent 37% of the state um, but only 19% of the positive cases and 30% um, of the deaths. And there has been some interesting shifts with um, surges in, in non-BIPOC uh, of people of color communities, which we can touch on later. And then there's the numbers for multi-race and um, other. Uh, here's an example of a county level dashboard. So I encourage um, all of you, if you haven't already, to visit your county's public health department website so that you can look to see what information is being shared publicly and how are they doing with breaking down uh, race and ethnicity data, age groups, gender, also uh, other, other demographic information. So now I'm going to move into some maps that have been uh, surfacing, looking at, you know, health inequities and COVID. So the first one here is from the UCLA Center for Neighborhood Knowledge. And um, I just got this, these maps today. This one shows the Renner vulnerability map. And so as you will see there in the key, the purple is represents the highest vulnerability. And um, I just wanted you know, to take a look and think about where you are right now in the state and your neighborhood and what you know about it. This is the built environment risk map. So this takes into account uh, environmental factors. Uh, maybe it, do you live near a high pollution area? Um, what might be some risks to your health because of the built environment? So again, I encourage you to take a look at where you are. And if you start noticing maybe some trends looking at the maps that are gonna come forward. And especially in the middle, like Fresno, the Central Valley area, but also some in the Bay Area and some in, in Los Angeles County and in Southern California. 
This is a map showing the barriers to accessing services. And so again, um, I wanna point out, especially if it's hard for you to ascertain the colors, that the dark orange represents, you know, the higher percentile barrier to accessing services. And then it goes up to lighter orange, to a yellow, green, dark green. And here's a social vulnerability map. And I won't go into how that's being defined. Um, I encourage you to visit the UCLA centers uh, to, to get more information. Now this slide, the pre-existing health condition map, again, you know, take a look at where is those dark orange, um, darker yellow areas. And you'll, you know, you start seeing a trend and seeing if, you, if we put these maps together, we could probably see certain areas that would be, you know, more impacted. Now shifting into uh, economic justice, worker justice slides, um, and I'm going to wrap up, I think, in the next three slides. So here is the top 15 occupations that are considered frontline low wage uh, jobs. So here's our map of our, or a breakdown of essential workers. So that the top farm workers, 80%. The farm workers represent 80% of our frontline low wage essential workers. We have janitors up there next, cashiers, personal care aides, cooks, and so on. And here is the race and ethnicity of the frontline essential workers. You'll see the top line farm workers, overwhelmingly 93% Latinx. Next, construction laborers, 78% Latinx. So we start to see some trends telling a story here of COVID-19 being a story of housing injustice, of economic injustice, of um, health inequities, and also uh, about immigration. So this is a, a, a table here showing the number of immigrant frontline essential workers, the number of people born in a different country, and farm workers, 81%. Food preparation workers, 55%. Construction laborers, 55%. Cooks, 54%, and so on. And um, I think I went the wrong direction. Yeah, so we will wrap it up there. And again, this was just to lay some, uh, give an overview, high level overview of, of the data of some of the topics that we're gonna talk about and the intersecting topics. Um, when we're talking about health and, and, and the disparate impact of COVID. So I thank you so much, Maria. You. That was wonderful. Um, and shouts out to UCLA uh, Luskin School. I graduated from there with Pascal's wife before it was called the Luskin School. Uh, we both studied urban planning there. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate you being here and sharing this pertinent information. Next, I have some questions for Dr. Martos. Dr. Martos, can you please address the um, disaggregation of race ethnicity data? Um, I believe uh, Maria touched on it earlier and how um, the lack of doing so can mask significant disparities in smaller subpopulations. Yeah, um, uh, thank you, Maria, for, for giving us that, that context and that you, you touched on that a little bit and specifically calling out the, the native Hawaiian Pacific Islander population. Um, that's a, a population that we have really been trying to take a very intentional look at uh, in my own work. And the reason for that is that very often, both in within uh, Kaiser Permanente organization, but just throughout the country, uh, what we see is, you know, that's a population that gets aggregated with Asian, so they'll be kind of clustered as Asian and Pacific Islander, despite the fact that they are two distinct, um, legally speaking, two distinct racial groups, um, uh, federally recognized, right? So they, despite that, we're often seeing them aggregated together. And the issue with that is that Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders um, in the United States and California uh, represent a much smaller number in the overall API kind of umbrella category. And so when we're looking at health disparities, we would see, you know, uh, 
at under API, this, uh, these outcomes showing that maybe the, the, they weren't as impacted, uh, don't have as severe consequences to things like COVID or, or any other health condition. When in reality, when you pull that out and you look at just those two distinct groups, you see that native Hawaiian Pacific Islander populations are in fact really disproportionately impacted, not just by COVID, but by a number of different chronic conditions and illnesses. Um, so, so that's kind of an easy go-to an example, something that we're dealing with in real time right now. But the reality is that each of these racial groups are not a, you know, a monolith. They are not one cohesive group that has the same health profile across the board. There is really immense diversity in every single one of them. So it, it's really important to not just look at it in terms of race, but whenever possible, really try to drill down and be specific about who you're talking about, who is the most directly impacted by these conditions. Um, because, you know, we, we can see disparities arise at these intersections of, of gender, of ethnicity, uh, of, of, across socioeconomic indicators. And, and that's how we're really going to be able to target very intentionally and very carefully who needs additional support. Um, otherwise, we're just kind of still trying a one size fits all with just maybe a slightly smaller group and that's not gonna that's not really gonna work thank you so much dr martos and you answered the second question that i had um which was how uh how could you or how should we address the health disparities across various racial groups but it sounds like a one size fits all approach is not the best approach. And so we have to do, I see you shaking your head, Dr. Estes White. <laughs> so we have to uh, create uh, solutions that will be, uh, will, will fit each group. So thank you. Of course, and, and not to also, not to diminish the importance of race as an indicator, right? It, it's still very important in and of itself, but, um, but I think we, we just want to make sure that we're being very specific about who exactly we're talking about. Um, without a doubt, uh, race and uh, race plays a role in health, and it's not about a person's individual, uh, you know, how their race contributes to health outcomes, but really how race as this social construct, uh, racism, racist policies, systemic racism. Um, uh, really plays out across these groups and, and leads to, you know, the layering of all these policies and behaviors and practices lead to differential outcomes over time. Thank you so much. I appreciate you sharing your insight. And one thing I failed to mention is that everyone is speaking here in their personal capacity, not as a representative or their organization. And the opinions expressed here are not necessarily CLA's opinions. Every, we're just here talking. So um, wanted to get that out there. Um, so next, Dr. Larissa, can you shed light on um, the transmission of COVID-19 and community empowerment um, and how community empowerment is something that um, is working for Alameda County? Um. Thank you, Adrianette, and I'm really honored to be here and speak today with everyone here and, and be able to engage in dialogue a little bit more about COVID and the transmission of COVID. And, um, you know, Dr. Martos reflected on the one size fits all and an approach that we took in Alameda County was really a, a targeted, targeted universalism approach as to how do we identify the communities most impacted and work to resource those communities to respond to their needs and ensure that they're able to be responsive uh, holistically. And so I'll talk a little bit about that. So when we talk about COVID um, and, and part of the reason why I put some of these slides together is given that we're in the holiday season and um, there's been this push to socially or physically distance, um, but there's also this pull to wanna to be around family and that's totally understandable. Um, but we are really in a, in a space right now with um, the beds filling up in our hospital systems, particularly ICU beds, 
and the increased um, right or the rising cases that we are seeing in our communities and the importance of why we must um, shelter in place. And I just want to be clear that, you know, shelter in place is really a public health prevention strategy to reduce disease transmission. And so this is just an illustration of the incubation period of, of COVID and that um, over the course of a two week period, um, you cannot be symptomatic or and test negative and then eventually become symptomatic and test positive. And in that time period and exposing yourself to other people, um, you run the risk of um, passing that infection to others, which I'll talk about in a moment, but also um, for those who may not have been physically present at something you attended, um, they bring that home and they often can impact those that are much more vulnerable, um, such as older adults and others with co-occurring chronic conditions. So when we talk about um, really what um, and how COVID can spread, it is as we understand it and as the science is evolving in our understanding, it really is through aerosols and droplets. So breathing, sneezing, coughing, um, talking, yelling, our bodies release these particles through our mouth that can either hang in the air for quite some time or fall to the ground. And depending on the circulation, the air circulation within a, a room or um, in a building, that can impact how these aerosols are spread. And so, you know, questions are coming up as um, public health experts are looking at how is the ventilation in, in, in facilities and buildings? Is it bringing you know, fresh air in and pumping the old air straight back out? Um, is it recirculating air? I mean, these are questions that we've heard come up about airplanes, about workplace. And it, there are things that you do have to very much consider is how is the air moving in a space? This is a, um, a series of modeling that has come out of Spain that really does a great job of illustrating the impact of COVID in a gathered space. And this is why we are encouraging folks to continue to remain physically distanced in the, and particularly um, during this time period as we are ex experiencing a surge. And in this modeling, you can see it's noon in a living room, folks are fairly distant and you've got one person that um, has COVID-19. Four hours later, with uh, no safety measures. Um, so no masks, no air moving, um, no additional distance between each other. Within four hours, the aerosols within the room puts every single person at risk for contracting the virus. In four hours, the simulation says if everyone wears a mask, those aerosols are still present in the room. They still land on your mask and then you kind of fumble with your mask and you still touch your face or you, you know, you touch the, um, an armrest or a table. Those aerosols can still be present. And then, you know, if you touch your face, touch a doorknob, come back and touch your face, um, it does still increase your risk. And so what we're seeing here is that even with face masks in a poorly ventilated space, um, the risk of, of the virus is still there. However, when you ventilate a space, um, the, reduce, the risk is reduced tremendously and hence why um, for any type of gathering that is allowable under the current restrictions, it's often outdoors. For example, um, you have your, your drive-through um, uh, worship services, you have your outdoor gyms up to a certain level of people. And it, it, part of this is again, to be in a space where you have ongoing circulation and um, you also are allowed to be physical distance, but it does do that does decrease the risk of the spread of the virus. And I did want to just acknowledge um, this idea of a social bubble. And within Alameda County, um, we've talked about social bubbles of being, you know, up to three households, no more than twelve people, where you're these are the only folks you're interacting with. But um, as Farhad Manju of the New York Times illustrated in an op-ed several weeks ago, just before Thanksgiving, uh, when he started to map out what his social bubble looked like, it really was a lot bigger than he anticipated. And here's his family right here in the middle. And so between you know, his children being in school, his colleagues, neighbors, 
um, the risk is just perpetually grown in the number of contacts that you have outside your home and hence why we are actively encouraging folks to shelter in place and remain in ho at home as much as possible. And these are the sacrifices that we must make um, for the greater good and to collectively support each other as we're in this for really the long haul. And in Alameda County, um, when we started to disaggregate the numbers by zip code uh, earlier in the pandemic, we started to see um, several hotspots uh, where you had a higher number of cases. Um, and you can see them in the darker blues over in here, uh, which reflect uh, the Fruitvale San Antonio neighborhood. Um, you have East Oakland, which is here. Uh, you have a couple here, which is unincorporated Alameda County. Ashland and Cherryland. And then there, you can't really see it reflected here, but there's a, a corridor within um, South Hayward that was heavily impacted. And, and I just have to share, um, when I went down to the, the Tennyson corridor in, in South Hayward and um, was just driving to go meet with a county supervisor and others to tour this the area, um, I knew exactly why COVID was spreading rampant. It was crowded housing that was multi-generational um, and that you had a large population kind of living on top of each other. And if you think about the model of how those aerosols can spread, um, the risk is increased, um, especially if there are a frontline uh, or um, necessary uh, essential worker. Um, they have to go to work because rent out here is expensive. We all know that. And they're at risk because of that exposure with that social bubble. And they come home and potentially expose um, their family members and others within their immediate community. And so as Alameda County started to look at these numbers, um, Alameda County Healthcare Services, Alameda County Public Health, and Alameda County Social Services implemented a suite of programs really looking at influxing these communities heaviest hit with resources. So testing was expanded in focus in these communities. Case investigation and contact tracing was um, expanded in these communities. Um, community outreach and education and information. One community that um, presented itself as being extremely at high risk was the mom speaking community. And um, their language, for example, is not written down. So we couldn't put out a flyer and expect them, uh, that community to, to read the flyer. It really required working with grassroots organizations that had to direct relationships with families in that community to be able to communicate and spread through word of mouth um, the importance of wearing a mask and being physically distant and, and, and isolating as much as possible. Alameda County um, also launched emergency food distribution um, in the and in, in particularly in these areas. They did it countywide, but the idea is if you need to shelter in place or you're exposed to COVID or test positive to COVID, we want you to stay in your home. And so ensuring that food was delivered to your home so that you don't have to worry about a meal and having to go to work so that you can feed your family. Something else that we've done in Alameda County is um, what we're calling the arch stipend. So initially, if you tested positive in one of these zip code areas, um, you were offered a $1,250 stipend to help alleviate the economic burden of having to shelter in, or to isolate and quarantine with your family. And what we've done in recent weeks is spread this initiative countywide and also increase access to um, particularly young people who are part of foster care systems um, or who are transitioning out of foster care so that they have supports in this space. We've also done things like emergency child care grants, um, supplies, emergency shelters, and also looking at workplace safety because in those um, essential worker work environments, there are increased risk of transmission. Oops, excuse me. So in building bridges across initiatives, what we really were trying to do was leverage the relationships that many as county agencies had with community-based partners and grassroots organizations and leverage those partnerships where we already had established relationships and trust to 
build upon those partnerships, invest in those partnerships, build capacity amongst those organizations to better serve and do the work um, more amplified uh, than what they had already been doing. So this is where the investment of resources, capacity building supports really took place. And within the um, Fruitvale San Antonio neighborhood, for which I'm, I'm most um, familiar with some of the, the on, on the ground work, um, this type of relationship allowed the community partners really to see the need and quickly pivot in a way that um, we're not always able to pivot as a government. And so they were able to quickly mobilize and support families with Wi-Fi hotspots for kids that needed to continue online learning. That's a huge disparity that we, you know, we won't even get a chance to touch on, but the digital divide, particularly in communities um, of color. Um, there's also, they were able to launch emergency food distribution. And because again, we were starting to see lines pretty early on within the pandemic. And many of these community-based organizations pivoted very quickly into doing doorstep delivery where they were delivering meals. Um, one organization was actually delivering two to three weeks worth of food to ensure that, and, and this was shelf stable food and some produce to ensure that families were able to stay home and shelter in place. And it was these initiatives, and, and, and when I say these initiatives, these are things that were, you know, funded by social services, funded by First Five Alameda County, you know, in partnership with other philanthropic partners, that we were just able to take their wisdom and their connection with community residents to be able to amplify this work that was already happening. So this is just a list of some of the efforts that we've implemented to date, um, of course, leaning on existing relationships and really just building upon that trust. I mean, I think there's so much wisdom in the communities that we all live in and serve, and there's an opportunity to learn from that wisdom and build upon that wisdom to better serve those that are at greater risk. Um, we provided some technical assistance and strategic support. We've um, engaged in collaborative meetings. A lot of times there were these meetings that were happening that were reporting out. And what we watched over time, over the last several months, is it went from I served X number of households to, well, how do, how do we work together? I need a fridge. Is that, can someone help me with a fridge? Or how do we coordinate with delivery supports to families in this neighborhood? We also work to increase um, access to funding to some of those programs that, that I mentioned earlier. And we're also continuing to explore how do we further coordination and learning across um, the organization so that we can take these lessons learned as we move through COVID into recovery and building resilience within communities. These are some of the just the lessons that we learned in this space. Um, community wisdom is huge. And what we've learned is how do we streamline processes to reduce the burden on community? There's an, impact, there's an opportunity to support economic development. For many of these CBO partners that are doing, for example, emergency food distribution, they were able to hire um, many folks short term and be able to inflex dollars at the local level in their neighborhoods um, to support the economic solvency of many families. And so this was actually an economic driver as well when um, many of our county partners started to invest in this, in this manner. You know, multi-sector solutions is, is going to be what it takes. And I think over the course of this call and even just being on this call, you know, there are roles for um, the legal system in this space. Um, when we talk about advocacy, when we talk about um, some of the legislation that is out there, there, there are key opportunities in this space. And finally, you know, at the end of the day, you, we have to move at the speed of trust. Um, through many of our institutional structures that have perpetuated racism, there is a high level of mistrust. And part of what we have to do as good stewards of government is to help to rebuild that trust and be authentic and intentional in, in the work that we do with community. And that can take time. It's, it can be messy too. But um, what we have learned is when we hold community at the center of this work, and focus on really what's important, we can make change and transformation. And I firmly believe that much of the work that 
we have done in this time period and that we're moving forward with over the coming months is going to influence and impact how we interact um, with community-based organizations and with residents for the better. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Larissa. That was wonderful. Um, the slides um, really speak for themselves. So thank you so much for putting that together. Next, we will hear from Dr. Pascal DeBell. Um, I have several questions for you, Pascal, um, but I think one of the things that is most important um, in light of the uh, information that has been shared is really, Dr. Pascal, how do we flatten the curve? How can we, what do we, what, let's, let's start with there. How do we flatten the curve? And can you also speak to PPE? Yes. Hi, Adrianette. Thank you for organizing. And thank you, Maria. Thank you, Dr. Estes White. And thank you, Alex. Um, so it's, it's been a crazy year for everyone. Um, kind of hit us unexpectedly. Um, but the year is, it's, it's been long. It's been very long, it's been very stressful. So I do hope that everybody is doing well, taking care of yourselves and staying safe. So in terms of flattening the curve, um, the biggest thing when you say flatten the curve, it means to slow down the rate of spread, um, slow down hospitalizations, because the way that the hospital system works is it's, it, it functions very well when it's not at capacity. But when you start stress, um, stretching out supplies, you start overworking nurses, you start having one nurse, instead of seeing two patients, they're seeing three or four at a time. Um, doctors are just overworked, being woken up all night, patients are unstable. Um, mistakes will happen. Treatment will be delayed. And people are gonna get exposed and make mistakes. And if you're making mistakes, then you yourself are likely to get infected by having to reuse your mask, by not having um, good gloves or good masks. Um, and once the hospital system gets into this state, it is a disaster. Um, I work mostly in um, the Sun Valley and Mission Hills area and our hospitals um, were doing pretty well um, for a long period of time, um, even into August, we were doing fairly well, but in terms of places south of us, um, some of the places they did not flatten the curve and their small hospital systems got overwhelmed. And then they had to transfer patients to us almost an hour and a half or two hours north. By the time some of the patients got to us, it was there was no chance. Um, at one point in time, those patients would come in. We would try everything in our power, every treatment, and every, every, every single day for a span of weeks, I would see about two or three people die every single day. Um, and honestly, this year, I've seen more people die than I ever have wanted to see. Um, some people don't believe that people are dying, but I'm telling you, I've seen too many deaths and it gets to a point that you see so many deaths that it, it almost becomes numb. It's almost what you expect. The patient comes in and you're just looking saying, am I even going to be able to do anything? Um, and even the doctors, the nurses, I, I have colleagues, I have, um, friends who are nurses and some of them have gotten COVID, have gotten sick. Um, thank God I don't know anybody who's um, passed away who's close in terms of being a colleague or family. But if we don't do our best to flatten this curve by following guidelines, by wearing our masks, um, masks don't hurt anyone. I mean, if, if it was going to hurt anybody, I'll be, I wouldn't be here right now because I, when I'm at work, I wear one. I wear N95 for hours and hours and hours on end, and I'm still alive. I don't have brain damage. I, none of that has happened, um, but we have to keep ourselves safe and we have to protect each other. We have to protect our families. We have to protect our communities. 
um, social distance. You'll suffer for months to a year. But the, the good part is if you're able to flatten the curve, protect the hospital system, protect the healthcare workers, allow us to do our jobs to the fullest of our ability so that we could save as many people as possible, it's, it's just going to be better. Um, vaccines are here. They're coming. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. But you want everyone who we're able to save, family, friends, strangers, people you don't know. If we can save them and go into 2021, 2022, every life we save by making sacrifices, following guidelines, it, it's just going to be better and it's going to be less for us to think about um, when we come out of this. And we want to come out of this saving as many people as possible. Um, in terms of personal protective equipment, when um, the virus literally started to pick up in March, I felt like it started earlier. I started seeing patients getting sick in February and I was a little bit concerned and we weren't even taking the, the serious precautions at that point in time. But once it transitioned into March and it just started spreading more rapidly, hospitals got ravaged. I mean, patients came in, hospital staff came in, people panicked, they grabbed up boxes of gloves, they grabbed up all the masks. I mean, they grabbed gowns. Literally every hospital started with supplies on ration. Just to get a mask, somebody had to go into like a locked facility to get you a mask or to get you gloves. And fast forward like eight months later, we're still in the same situation. I can't find large gloves. So now I'm squeezing into a medium sized glove and I'm at risk for my gloves ripping when I'm making contact with a patient with COVID. They were recycling and washing masks and then bringing them back for you to use. And we've never done that before. They're saying, oh, it's gonna work, but are you sure it's gonna work? Is there gonna be a defect? Am I gonna put myself at risk? Um, and by not overwhelming the system, I think that we can preserve supplies that we have. A lot of the supplies cannot be reused. So when you're seeing hospitalizations in the United States pushing up to about 100,000 and climbing daily, the system is going to get overwhelmed and doctors will get stressed out. Nurses will get stressed out. They'll be at risk. They'll start getting sick. And then that's when mortality rate, morbidity is going to shoot up. Thank you so much, Pascal. Can you please um, speak to the long-term impacts on health, um, chronic lung disease, kidney disease, which I know is your expertise, um, higher risk for clotting, et cetera. And also uh, with the kidney um, piece, acute kidney injury and need for uh, hemodialysis, continuing renal replacement therapy. Um, so one of the things that um, we've been seeing is patients get COVID, their biggest problem that they'll come in with is shortness of breath. But the shortness of breath is just one thing. You could feel short of breath, but still be oxygenating well. And the air that we breathe now, there's about 21% oxygen. But by breathing only 21% oxygen, if I check the oxygen level in your blood, it should be at least 99 to 100%. Patients will come in short of breath, we'll give them 100% oxygen and you'll check their blood oxygen level and it'll be 77%. And these numbers, your body does not want this deficit of oxygen. Your organs will not tolerate it. And it becomes, it becomes a big problem. Um, there's such intense inflammation in the lungs that the tissue just cannot absorb the oxygen. Um, there's multiple theories and um, reasons why this happens in terms of your body trying to fight off the virus, releasing a lot of inflammatory markers like cytokines that just intensifies um, what's happening in the lung. It's not even necessarily the virus that's causing you to not be able to absorb the oxygen. It's more of the, the inflammatory aspect of it. And the, the patients need very, very high levels of oxygen to try to maintain their oxygen saturation at a level that's basically compatible with life. 
if your oxygen saturation stays at 77%, 70%, I mean, you're going to end up with multiple organ injury, brain injury. Um, I mean, it's just not compatible with life. And what I've also noticed is um, in the beginning, they would intubate, which is putting the breathing tube into patients very early. And you notice that the moment you do that, mortality rate shoots up. So now we've been uh, more proactive in trying to avoid the intubation. Um, we do the oxygen. Um, we do um, something called proning, um, basically by having them lay on their belly. Um, it takes some weight off of the lungs and um, improves oxygenation to some degree. Um, but trying to avoid intubation has been one of the biggest things that actually has been saving lives because the patients that I've seen get intubated, I have not seen many actually walk out of the hospital. And the ones that have walked out of the hospital, they walk out in very bad shape. And some of them have a tracheostomy. So they're basically breathing through the neck and it's, they're drained, they have no muscle left. I mean, it's pretty bad. And aside from the oxygenation issue and uh, having to be intubated, um, I, we've also been seeing a lot of um, acute kidney injury. So a patient will come in, kidney functions perfect. And throughout the course of their hospitalization, you'll see their kidney function start to drop and drop and drop um, to the point that they're uh, not even passing urine. And when that happens, if you eat, you drink, you get medications, you're getting fluids um, through the IV, then all of a sudden you can't pee it out. It starts to accumulate. And if it's accumulating in lungs that already cannot absorb oxygen, you're gonna drop the oxygen levels even more and then push the patient into the intubation. And if they go that route, it's bad. So one of the things that we've been doing, uh, I personally will um, give patients medications to try to make them pee, um, to keep them dry, to keep their lungs dry, to try to improve oxygenation in the lungs. And when it gets to the point that the kidneys are just not doing well and you kind of have no choice, they're not peeing, the blood is getting dirty, you're, they're not eliminating waste. Um, we sometimes do hemodialysis. And then we also do something called continuous renal replacement therapy, um, which many hospitals do not have. If you're not at a, a, near a big academic center or a big hospital system, you will not have the same care available to you, um, which will also then increase your risk of mortality and uh, morbidity. And this is one of the things that's happening in um, many minority communities. Um, they don't have access to the same level of care. They might not have access to the same medications and they might not have access to, um, for example, if you go to UCLA or one of the big um, training hospitals, they have something called ECMO. Um, basically, they'll take your blood out, they'll put oxygen in it, and then they'll put the blood back into your body. But every hospital does not have this. So if you go there, you might have a chance of survival. Or if you go to a, a, a big academic hospital, you might be able to get a lung transplant, where if you're in a little community hospital or an Aurora hospital, your chances of getting a, a lung transplant is zero. So you're not going to get the same care. Um, as somebody um, who's basically placed in the right setting, um, is knowledgeable about the healthcare system, um, and is just has the connections to find their way to get the best treatment and the best care. Um, yes, did I answer all those questions? You did. Thank you so much. Um, and I'll ask you this last question, and then I'll, I will also ask the same question oh, to you. Oh, I, forgot, I forgot. I forgot the long-term impacts. Oh, yes. Um, what most people don't realize is that it hasn't even been a full year of COVID-19 for the United States yet. We do not know everything. We don't want to assume that we know everything. And we've been seeing things that we have not seen before. This acute kidney injury. Um, the, the, the blood clots, people losing limbs. I mean, we have not seen these things before, mostly specifically to just a virus. I mean, you've kind of seen it, but not this widespread. 
And we do not know the long-term effects. Some people say that, oh, you get COVID and you're immune. That is not, that is not 100% true. Um, I have seen patients come in, get tested for COVID more than one, have symptoms, um, go through a hospitalization that is like two or three weeks long, test negative for COVID more than once because I have to place them back in a, in a dialysis unit. They leave the hospital asymptomatic, at least two negative tests. And then a month later, they're back with COVID. Fever, uh, shortness of breath, low oxygen levels, and they should be immune, right? So we don't know how long the immunity lasts. That's one thing. There are mutations that take place in the virus. There's multiple mutations that they're finding. So do you know that if you get one um, type that you're not gonna get one of the mutations and it just bypasses your immune system? We don't know this. And the other thing is, is, is this gonna be seasonal, right? Can you get COVID this year and then you don't have many symptoms? What's gonna happen when you get it next year? So don't be in a rush to get it. <laughs> Try to avoid getting it until we learn more and you know what the long-term and the chronic effects are gonna be. Are you gonna get lung cancer 10, 20 years from now? Are you gonna have COPD, emphysema, um, chronic bronchitis? Are you gonna be oxygen dependent um, somewhere down the line in the future? Are you gonna be more prone to getting blood clots? Are you gonna be prone to getting chronic kidney disease um, in the future and then eventually end up on dialysis and then your life completely changes? We don't know, it hasn't been a full year. So we all have to do our best to try to avoid getting it, delay it for as long as possible, flatten that curve. And then as we get more information, Maybe by the time you get it somewhere down the road, or at least you get vaccinated and protect yourself, we'll know more, we'll have better treatments, and your chances of getting any type of chronic, long-lasting morbidity from this virus will be minimized or mitigated. Well, well, thank you so much for that. And, um, you know, I think in um, Dr. Larissa's slides, she also said that, uh, you know, we don't know that we don't know all that there is to know about it and, and uh, we're still uh, working on it. But uh, my next question for you and the panelists is, you know, earlier you talked about um, access and um, rural communities versus, you know, larger metropolitan areas and also communities of color having access to things. How can attorneys work to shape healthcare policies that will have a direct impact on lowering the COVID-19 with an emphasis on lowering the COVID-19 rate in minority um, communities, even whether they be rural or metropolitan areas? I mean, I think advocacy is, is the number one space. I, I, you know, for right now we're approaching um, really what we're calling a fiscal cliff um, with the end of CARES Act. Um, earlier in the year, um, the Congress, the US Congress passed the CARES Act, which released um, relief funds to come and trickle down through um, states and other in, in local jurisdictions to help provide supports. That funding expires, or that, that uh, policy expires uh, December 30th. And so after that, um, there is some uncertainty as to um, how we will be able to continue some of the supportive services like food distribution, like um, cash stipends, um, housing, other, other elements. Um, there is some funding that continues through April related to testing and contact tracing. So that's not as much of a concern. But, um, you know, advocating to with your um, your elected officials and particularly those who are in Congress to push towards getting a bill approved before they go on Christmas break. Um, it will take time if they do get something passed for that funding to trickle down, but it at least continues to provide that safety net that many communities need. And California itself is a is a tax based um, 
uh, economy. And when you have folks sheltering in place, um, the the revenue isn't ju- isn't there anymore. And you have people that are unable to go to work, and so they're not they're unable to pay their rent. Um, landlords are unable to pay their mortgages, and so this is this is huge, huge um, impact. And so, advocating to your elected officials is really huge. Um, and you know, we can't say enough about that. Thank you so much, Pascal. Do you have any thoughts on how attorneys can work to shape? Healthcare policies. Um, the the biggest thing is trying to make sure everybody has access to good care. Um, being in a rural community and having a hospital that doesn't have access to dialysis, for example, or not being able to get the medications that everybody else is getting, having the the remdesivir, having um, good access to getting like dexamethasone, which is the steroid that they're using. If they could get involved and somehow shape, change policy to make sure that if this small hospital is not getting the funding, if this small hospital is not getting access to what their um, partners in the big metropolitan areas are getting, like, how do you make that happen? How do you get people access to the, the type of healthcare that they need? Um, and the, I wanted to add one thing that I forgot to discuss earlier. Um, so many people don't believe that people are dying from COVID, okay? You're seeing numbers on screens, the numbers are large, they're growing rapidly every single day. Um, and some people believe that no, people are dying from diabetes. People are dying from heart disease. People are dying from stroke. People are dying from other things and then they're just classifying them as COVID, all right? Let's just pretend that we're not sure, right? Say that you don't know that it's COVID and we're not even testing, you're not doing anything. People are just coming in, they're short of breath, there's fever, people are dying. There's one specific data that you can look at, the health department every single year tracks all of the mortality, all of the mortality in the United States. And there's models that can actually predict how many people are gonna die in the United States on an annual basis, okay? And the number for this year has been surpassed by over 300,000 already. Okay, and we're saying that there's almost 270,000 or so deaths from COVID, but there's still a surplus of additional deaths that we don't even know. Are those deaths from COVID before we knew? Um, Because I have seen young individuals in their 20s and 30s pass without knowing before they even were able to get tested, die from a, a pneumonia that just didn't respond to antibiotics, or was it the lack of care. Were they not able to get the care that they needed? And that's how you got another 50 or 60,000 additional deaths from the system being overwhelmed or a hospital being overwhelmed and somebody dies from something else, like something that could have easily been treated, yet the, the system is so focused on COVID and is like paralyzed by COVID that these patients are not getting the care that they need. But the numbers, the numbers are real. Um, whether you believe it's COVID or not COVID, whether you believe it's something else and they're just throwing COVID into the mix, people live with diabetes. People live with heart disease, even though it's the number one killer. But we know how many people are supposed to die almost by some model that is calculated every single year, but we have surpassed it significantly. So something is, is happening. So for anyone who doesn't understand or doesn't believe or believes that the patients are dying from something else, they're coming to the hospital because they're short of breath, their lungs are inflamed, they have fever, and they have COVID-19. And Adrian, I do just want to add um, a couple other thoughts and kind of building off of uh, Dr. Pascal's um, thinking over, you know, we've 
don't know this science is evolving in front of us when it comes to this disease. And um, we don't know what next year will look like. We don't know what the impact of these conditions will be in the future. And thus an important role that attorneys can take in this space is one advocating to continue to uphold the Affordable Care Act and particularly the clause related to pre-existing conditions. And then the other space that I'm thinking as it relates to, um, and I'm not an actuary, so I, I'm not quite sure how, what are the costs that are being associated with COVID, but this is where attorneys that have healthcare policy experience can work with health plans and work with um, healthcare um, systems to really explore what are the ways to look at how costs are likely being disproportionately impacting, especially communities of color, where um, people tend are, are being infected at a higher rate and are sicker. And um, that means that they're holding a burden of the healthcare dollar on that one individual. And it's going to burden not only that individual as a person, but our county systems, as well as our federal systems, because th that tax dollar circulates constantly. And something else that I, I wanna highly recommend is that we have um, county boards and commissions, as well as local boards and commissions that impact decision-making or related to health and equity, whether it be housing, or um, social services or agriculture and environment, that all impacts how the, the, the morbidity and mortality and especially amongst communities. And if they've been historically disinvested in, um, you need to have that lens of how do we think about how to invest in these communities. And that lens can often come through these boards and commissions at your county or in your local jurisdiction. Thank you so much. Attorney Maria, you work exactly in the intersection of the intersectional space between law and healthcare and policy. What say you? <laughs> well, I think when we're talking about what we need, what we can do as attorneys to help undo health inequities and to undo the disparate impact, especially right now in this time of COVID on black and brown communities and other communities of color is I wanna invite my fellow members of the bar and other people in this legal profession to commit or recommit ourselves to help dismantle white supremacy and racism and its legacies and its byproducts, including displacement, wage theft, kidnapping and enslavement, family separation, segregation, incarceration, redlining, the ban of, on affirmative action in our state. We couldn't even get that back um, this last election, with Prop 16 failing. Uh, undoing the way that budgets are balanced on the people who have the least formal power and helping people build power. I have an organizing advocacy background. Growing up in East Oakland, uh, seeing my dad as a roofer, thankfully he had a union job, which meant we had healthcare. If we didn't have healthcare, um, and that's why he kept the union job, even though he struggled, you know, going through the, the ranks of that. Uh, but he always prioritized us having healthcare, and I think that's why I'm an attorney today. It's all connected. If I didn't have good quality healthcare, um, you know, I might not have been able to reach my goals, or it would have taken me a lot longer. And um, I think there's so many different ways beyond litigation that is really important. And and direct legal services, which I definitely advocate for and invite folks to plug into their local bar associations and their uh, legal services organizations in their cities, their counties. We're working really hard right now to represent people um, against evictions, which are still happening despite eviction moratoriums. That's well documented. There's also habitability issues that are happening year round, pre-COVID, during COVID, post-COVID. Uh, employment and workers' rights services are very much needed right now. Talking about issues and, and talking to contact tracers and people out there in the front lines and some of the most frequent uh, asks for services are for what can I do because my employer is making me go to work or they're making me you know, present a negative COVID test, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's definitely a need for that. 
Um, food insecurity is a huge issue and um, you know that's that that's worsening and it's spreading throughout different communities. Um, and also like I want to echo what everyone else said about uh, attorneys helping create more access to quality affordable health care, but also health care that's holistic and culturally relevant and conducive to healing intergenerational trauma and harm and really advocating for that. Some of our health care plans are so restrictive and they don't cover things um, because, you know, maybe the, the provider isn't a formal like a therapist or they're not licensed in a certain way. And so um, that's, that's what I would advocate for and invite my colleagues, you know, to think about in what ways can they engage in this and really looking at, you know, COVID recovery um, but looking at the, just like there's pre-existing health conditions and pre-existing inequities before COVID. Um, yeah. Thank and you so much. That was any. wonderful. That was great. Um, um, go ahead. You had something. Oh, yeah. I, I, I forget if uh, this forum, if other folks have other questions. Or oh, maybe you yep. Want to share other I actually just, Bree just gave us the green light. So, um, and if anyone has any questions, please put your questions in the chat. Um, the chat is, is, is no longer disabled. If you have questions, please put them in the chat um, or you are free. I don't know if people, um, let me see if, let me change my view. If yeah, well, people are thinking about see. that. Something else that unfortunately is on the rise that we've heard a lot about and, and but not enough because we need to help amplify. And, you know, we attorneys were loud. We could be really loud. Not everyone. I know there's some more quiet folks, but helping amplify some of these issues that have come up during COVID, like the rise of interpersonal, um, intimate partner violence, domestic violence. I know there's a rise of also community violence in East Oakland right now during COVID. Um, a lot of family law, child welfare issues. Uh, my most, my previous job, I was representing parents in child welfare cases and, uh, you know, family separation is a big, big, um, yeah, big harm in, in our communities. Um, I would also invite attorneys to join uh, boards and uh, of nonprofits, small businesses, helping them with, um, you know, their leases. There's going to be a lot of need. And so if you're a business, whatever skill you have, you know, think about how can you help right now in our communities, especially our black and brown communities that are struggling. Thank you so much. And I do see um, the director, the executive director of CLA on. Ona, thank you for coming. Um, CLA has actually done a lot in terms of providing resources for attorneys um, for specifically for COVID-19. So um, I appreciate the efforts that CLA has made under your leadership, Ona. Um, if we, do we have questions? I don't see anyone's hand up. Oh, hi, Terrence. We see you also. <laughs> hey, I actually had a quick question and it's uh, regarding the vaccine. I know there are a number of concerns in communities of color, especially in light of the Tuskegee incident and just uh, the way the current administration has handled uh, this pandemic. Uh, that a lot of folks don't plan to get the vaccine, don't trust it, aren't sure about it. I mean, I'm personally a little worried about how safe it is considering how, how fast it was. I, I'm just wondering if any of the folks on the panel have any thoughts or concerns about the vaccine and how communities of color uh, should take it or shouldn't take it and, and just what your thoughts are. I know um, within Alameda County, um, we're leveraging the relationships that we built with community-based organizations that have a pulse on the community to help us understand how we message um, vaccinations. And we are using and leveraging the current flu season um, as a way to understand how we could potentially operationalize vaccinations in the county and particularly in those high risk communities. I, you know, the scars that um, the systems, including the system of healthcare, has placed upon people of color run very, very deep. And 
is as much as as myself that I've had interactions with the healthcare system. I've done healthcare policy. I still have my own reservations, and so those are valid reservations. But I also know about the value of public health and why many of us who are on this call today is because of vaccinations that we received before we went to school and we were five years old. The reason why we see outbreaks of measles now is because we have this anti-vaccination movement. And that's a problem because we do know that vaccinations can be very, very helpful. Um, you know, I, I defer to Dr. Pascal to talk a little bit more about the science behind the vaccinations, but there are, you know, several, there are at least a hundred plus that are in some level of trial. There is nothing that has been approved for human use. There are, I believe, six that have been approved for um, special use cases. Uh, the New York Times actually has a really good vaccination tracker uh, where you can see where different things are in the process, but nothing has been approved. And I do believe of the two, the Pfizer and the Moderna, one has gone to the FDA for emergency approval. Um, but they are, you know, there's a lot of risk in these vaccines, but there's risk every day. Um, in, in pre-COVID life, we were out on the streets a lot. We were at greater risk for motor vehicle crashes. Um, you know, versus contracting um, an infectious disease like the measles. But um, we're in a different period now. And, and I, I do believe in vaccinations, but you do have to honor and come in with intention and in working with communities of color that do have this distrust and you have to build that trust. And it, it will take time. Thank you. Dr. Pascal? Yeah, um, very good answer. Um, so... In terms of vaccines, we know that vaccines take time, right? The vaccines that are out now have come out in record time, record. I mean, something that should be taking somewhere over two years, three years, four years, going through the proper channels, um, clinical trials, making sure you have data on um, African-Americans, making sure you have data on, on, on the Latin um, communities, making sure you have data for pregnancy, making sure you have data. It's happened so fast and it's okay that it's happened fast, but as long as it's the people involved in science, people involved in medicine, people involved in things that we trust in when it comes to our health, we do not want outside people playing in that field and then that's where the distrust is going to come from. If you feel that they're just manipulating it somehow to get it out fast, just to reopen the economy, for example, and get everybody back to work, then you're going to, you're going to feel a certain type of way. You're going to want to protect your family. You're going to want to see data. You're going to want to know that the FDA, you're going to want to know that physician panels, everybody's been involved and done their due diligence, done their work to make sure that our safety comes first and make us feel comfortable. Make me know that somebody didn't just pay a lot of money, you guys rushed and did something and then you dodged all the proper channels and then now this vaccine's coming to me, right? And you don't even have data on me. You have data on some other population. Like, are you gonna give it to someone who just hasn't even been in your clinical trial. We don't know what it's gonna to do to this individual. Do you have anybody with cancer who are immunocompromised in your clinical trials? No, right? Um, so those are the things. I, it, it, the government needs to just stay out of it. They've already started their, their part. The companies had all the resources, the financial backing, everything they needed to get to work and really leverage everything that they had to make the vaccines, now let it go through the proper testing channels so that it could come out and be rolled out safely. Um, because no, everybody's afraid of, <laughs> of side effects and being tested on and they're like trying it on this community for the first time and you just don't know what's gonna happen. But at the same time, we have to look on the other end, there is something that's already ravaging the minority community, right? And we need something to get us out of that. But we want something safe, effective, and we need to know that it's not going to do harm um, because we all hear stories and there's been documented things that have happened with vaccines in the past. And in the state of a pandemic, if something happens, 
like who is going to be held accountable when they're throwing the word emergency use authorization and you all get vaccinated and next thing you know there's something going on like who's going to be held accountable are they just going to say this was an emergency so we had to rush and we skipped over the fda and undercut them and the vaccine got to me it got to you like we want to know that our vaccine is going through the the channels where science logic medicine comes first politics antics whatever it is is just on the outskirts and then we allow it to go through the proper channels so when it gets to us we trust it and i i believe in the scientists i believe in the science of vaccinations how it works getting to herd immunity safely um but the thing is, is it's going to be, I think they were voting today. I think it's going to be healthcare workers. So we're going to be the first round of, of guinea pigs. And we'll, we'll let you know, it's going to be a mix, mixed group of individuals um, testing it out first. And then it'll go to nursing homes, I believe, and other um, immunocompromised individuals. But before it gets to the uh, minority communities, um, you'll at least have some data um to look at and you'll know a little bit more about the side effect profile and and things like that thank you so much i see some questions in the chat um i think that um maria attorney maria answered jennifer's question um lolly roberts question um, prior to covid healthcare professionals routinely screened for domestic violence during the pandemic, has this changed? If anyone knows, Pascal is saying no. Dr. Yeah. Larissa? No, it hasn't changed. I mean, I think even pretty early on in like March and April, um, after the initial shelter in place order, I know from my contacts at uh, Children's Hospital Oakland that they saw a tremendous increase in um, interpersonal violence amongst children presenting to the uh, emergency departments. Okay, thank you. Um, Bill Tamayo says that the EEOC has a lot of information on their website regarding COVID-19, reasonable accommodations, failure to hire, rehire. So thanks so much to Bill for sharing that, um, that as a wonderful resource. resource. Um, going back to the vaccine question, oh, Maria, did you have something? I did just a shout out to the California Lawyers Association on our East Bay La Raza Lawyers Association. We have a um, link to CLA's resources and we also have a resources page. And I would just invite anyone who's part of um, any affinity bar associations to have that on their website and their social media. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so Ona's question um, is regarding side effects of vaccines. How long would it take before they show up? in those who've been vaccinated, if anyone knows? I definitely don't know. Um, I think for vaccines, usually within like 24 to 48 hours, um, you'll get that response. Your body's gonna know that the vaccine is in there. So you're gonna get the response. But I think some of the biggest um, side effects that they have um, listed so far is one is an injection site pain. Um, and you guys know some vaccines hurt, and then some other vaccines, you don't really feel anything, but you will have like some soreness. Um, fever um, is one of the common ones. And then like a flu-like um, illness. Um, I, I'm not sure if they're very specific and it might change um, depending on the individual, what your immune status is. Um, but I think that the, the, the injection site, site pain and the fever would be like the two biggest ones that I've um, read about. Great, thank you so much. Um, and I hope Jennifer Kohau, I hope we answered your question. Um, uh, Cause Larissa and Maria responded. Um, okay, Deborah Goldberg, and this is our last question cause now it's seven o'clock. Um, okay, great. I'm glad we answered your question, Jennifer. Uh, we're hearing that two of the vaccines are 95% effective. We're also hearing that there may be limited immunity for folks who have had COVID-19. How do these two concepts interrelate? For example, if a vaccine is 95% effective, what does this mean in terms of how long will the vaccine be effective for me? If anyone has the answer to that. 
I don't think we know. <laughs> I mean, this is this whole this is science evolving in front of our faces right now is we don't know. And especially as Pascal detailed the amount of or the, the speed for which these vaccines have moved from, you know, animal trials to human trials and now, you know, for emergency approval. Um you know, the the best um, the best piece of advice that I feel like I can offer and feel confident in offering is um, one, there's risk with everything. Um, you just you never know what how what and how you will respond to a vaccination. But also um, this this will just take time. Um as we get more and more data released and more um, publications on the impacts of the vaccination, I highly encourage folks to read it and work with folks throughout your community to understand that data and help translate it, particularly for uh, black and brown communities that may not have access to this type of information or um, because of institutional uh, racism practices through redlining, which have impacted education and, and literacy levels may not be able to understand and comprehend that. And so being able to translate this information is really, really important. And I, you know, I, I think that our public health departments are actively working on figuring out how to best translate this information for our communities. Thank you so much, Dr. Larissa. That's great. I, I want to second that and also say it as attorneys, you know, this is a critical time for us, especially knowing the history of eugenics and Tuskegee experiment, all of that for us to be oversight, to have oversight, to be watchdogs, to, you know, hold our ears and eyes close to the ground, what, to what's happening and to be there for one another and to, you know, yeah, like sound the bell and go to court if we need to. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that, um, Maria. Thank you so much to everyone for coming. I apologize. We're three minutes over. This was just great. I think this was one where we could have kept talking and talking, but thank you so much, Dr. Pascal, Attorney Maria, Dr. Larissa. Thank you so much, Dr. Alex. Thank you so much, everyone for coming. And this was recorded. So that means that you can come back to it later on and get more juicy information if you missed anything. Thanks so much.